Hello everybody. I am here this evening in Charlottesville, Virginia. I am over with a client and also any time that I'm not working, uh, I am talking to our good friends at Vectorvest in also in North Carolina and Ohio. And I have been checking in with people in San Diego after the Ireland Business Forum and so on. So it really is an American week for me. Now, that said, what I really want to do tonight is to share with you my book review on The Emigrant Edge. It's written here by Brian Buffini, and it is a New York Times bestseller. So I just want to give you a little bit of background on why, and then I'm going to tell you three key things that I've picked up from it. So Brian Buffini um, was born in Dublin. He's one of six children, and he went on to grow the largest real estate coaching business in America. So how did I come across him? Well, my husband, Ardell, typical Irish story. My husband, Ardell, his cousin went to school with him in South Dublin. And he said to me one time, uh, back in 2014, he said, I went to, to school with Brian Buffini. You should check him out. He's doing great things in America. So I did, and I sent an email, and I went over to see him uh, speak at an event in San Diego in 2014. And just in, in May of this year, I was in San Diego again, and I stopped by, and I picked up a copy of his book, and, uh, and I met him again, and also a number of his team, we released a podcast with Jamie Noah, for example. Um, she is the director of corporate development there. Um, but in particular, I read this book since, and I wanted to share with you why I think it's a really interesting read. So th the whole idea is the immigrant age is that people who are immigrants have an advantage in many ways on people who are local. And on the other hand, they have a complete disadvantage. So Brian Buffini started off in San Diego in California um, a long time ago, and he had $92 in his pocket. And from there, he went on to marry his wife, Beverly, have six children, and as I mentioned, build a business. But of course, it wasn't easy. But as he points out in here, what he needed to do was to leave her at the immigrant edge. So I, now I want to tell you what I got out of this. Um, first of all, I'm not an immigrant per se, because of course I live in Ireland. However, I'm, I'm fortunate that I get to spend a lot of time abroad. So I am in a funny place where I'm neither an immigrant nor somebody who lives all the time in the one place. Um, I have a little bit of a funny combination there. So when I read this, I wasn't sure whether I was reading it from the point of view of somebody who's never been an immigrant or from somebody who spends time intermittently being one. But it's an interesting angle that he has on this because what he talks about is, for example, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll t take you through a couple of one of the, the uh, now, by the way, he starts off with the disadvantages. And uh, when you read those, and I read them, by the way, I, I read that part of the book while I was in San Diego. So I was physically in his town um, reading about what he was talking about. And it makes very sobering reading, I can say. But then he goes on to talk about the, um, the advantages. So he says, for example, often um, immigrants are coming to a better place. So he describes the Dublin. I have to say that I don't, that doesn't resonate with me because I am in a Dublin that is fully, you know, it's very, it's full of um, various different organizations who've chosen it to be their European headquarters. It's full of lots of startups now. It's full of students who have big dreams of staying at home and doing very well and so on. So, you know, when I was reading it, he was describing it of a different place than what I have grown to be familiar with. But he also talks about, for example, uh, that immigrants are pursuing their dreams, that their backs are against the wall, they have to make it, and they have to go from there. And that is very much what absolutely does resonate from any time that I've been doing business in a different country, or of course, if I am meeting with the Irish diaspora in the various different ways in which I do. So he talks about that first, but the whole point is about looking at your situation as an immigrant would and looking at how you can have the edge. And he, spe he specifically mentions 21 challenges for you to take on and to run with. Now, um, I'm not gonna go through all 21 of them. What I am gonna go through are three points that really stuck out for me. Because a lot that he says in this book, um, I have, I've heard him say either before, or I've heard other people say, and it's absolutely correct. There's no doubt about that. But I have been implementing it and I have been pursuing it myself. So I'm not gonna mention those points to him to do that but what I am going to mention are three key things that I'm that have been that, are, that have really stayed with me I've started reading this book six weeks ago now when I finished it uh, about five days ago so the first key thing that he points out 
is it's actually challenge number, because I want to be clear on this, is challenge number seven, which is to be consistent. Now, um, being consistent, I have to say that is probably something that not an awful lot of us do from the point of view of that we start doing something and that we want to see a result fast. And what Brian Buffini mentions is how much better it is, is that if we really sow the seeds and then after a while, we will start to see the results. But two key things have to happen. Number one is that you need to know what, what the output of this is going to be. And number two is that you need to have the patience and the perseverance to keep going. Now, one thing I really like about Brian is that I have started listening to his podcast for another reason, which I'm going to mention in a while. I've met him, I've seen him speak on stage, and I've also read his book. So holistically, I've got more of an insight into this author than many others, many of the other authors that I've reviewed. And he really he makes that point over and over and over and over and over again. He consistently makes the point about being consistent. <clears throat> Now, my take on this is it's hard to have that patience, right? It is hard to have that patience. And the second problem with that is that it is hard to do more than one thing at once. So I might say to you right now, yes, okay, I'm going to start saving money. I'm going to start saving 10 euros a day into a savings account. And I'm going to start running two miles a day. And, right, already we have a problem. Now, I'm going to tell you how I have addressed both of those issues. Um, with some of what he says, both some of what he says, I got help from this book and some things that I've added on myself. So one of the things that I'm going to say around consistency is often we know that if we do something for, for long enough, it will make a difference. We do know that. OK, so therefore, I know that if I start implementing something for a while, like saving or like running, um, of course, I can't run at the moment because I still have my broken foot. So it's not something that I can do. But um, I, know, I do know that if, if I was to implement that consistently over time, that there will be a benefit from that. Okay, I'm sure of it. So since I arrived here, I got here in Charlottesville. I arrived here last Saturday. And what I started to do was I started to swim. Because as I mentioned, I can't run. And I'd, okay, so I got into the pool the first night, got into the pool the second night, and then the third night. And I started then looking at my arms in the mirror and wondering had they improved. Of course, they hadn't. And I was giving out. And then I was thinking, okay, hold on now, hold on, hold on, as if Rome could be built in a day. Because then imagine if I was to stop swimming and my, some part of my body went back to being a less desirable way than it was before in three days. Well, of course, I wouldn't be happy that way either. So the point is, is that instead is to set mini goals, is to say, okay, if I swim X amount of days in a row, uh, well, then I will give myself the reward of whatever else it might be. So therefore, the ultimate outcome is not what you're waiting on because it can take too long to see, but what you can reward yourself in doing is actually having the discipline to remain consistent. Um, now, the second thing I'm going to mention on this is how to create more than one habit at once. So while I've been out here, I have tried to create three habits and so far I'm doing it consistently. And here is how is that I am never trying to be consistent in one habit, sorry, in two habits in the same way. So I have tried to swim every day, which I have done except for one rest day, because that's important for your body. And uh, that's also something that he mentions and we all know to be clear. So, uh, but I have been consistent in what I have been set out to do, but that has been after I came back from where I've been with the client all day. While I have been with the client, I also wanted to create another habit, which is to drink two liters of water. I'm not drinking at all enough water. So that has been the second thing. So I've been focusing on that while I'm in with the client. I have a bottle. My water bottle is, is, is gone there somewhere. I've been trying for this habit for years now. So I'm really, really, really determined to make it happen this time. So, uh, so I've, been, I've been implementing that while I'm in with my client. I've been implementing the pool while I've been uh, here in the hotel. And then uh, separately, when I'm doing neither, that is when I'm implementing my business side of one. So I have, I have a business one. Um, now I'm really working hard at a different one and I'll tell you about it at a later stage. It's just I'm at the embryonic stages at the moment of refining it. So I don't wanna tell you something that hasn't worked already. So that is what I'm doing is that in each environment, I have a different one. And you know, it's seamless, it's seamless and I'm getting there and uh, so far so good. You might say, well now Susan, you're only a couple of days into this, I know. But the public accountability by telling you about this means that now there's now extra pressure on me that should my motivation dip down, that I know that I want to be loyal to you because you're watching this video or reading the subsequent blog posts that we're going to make of it. So therefore, I am now increasing the momentum behind my consistency. Okay, 
that's point number one. He makes this point, and I have to say, if should you listen to his podcast, which I highly recommend, or should you read the book, or should you do anything else where you come in to enter into it into an interaction with Brian Buffini or Buffini and Company, you will hear that point. The second thing that I want to mention is not so much what he mentions in the book, actually, but what he subsequently goes on to say in the podcast. Now, he talks an awful lot about, uh, again, I want to get the actual challenge itself so that you can refer to it. Um, it's all in uh, chapter 20. It's all about how to develop a willingness to outwork others, right? So he talks about in challenge eight, for example, to become exceptional. Now, outwork others, going the extra mile, um, digging deep, having resilience, right? Now, they, they're all different things, but they have shades of the same point. Now, I'm just, I'm going to give you my take on this, right? Is a lot of us go the extra mile for our clients. We really do. I see it all the time at VectorVest, for example. The team at VectorVest has a fantastic product and they have a fantastic customer service team. And I personally have been at the cold face of talking to the team in the US trying to get uh, some some sort of an additional product or service or experience or something for a customer of theirs where I know that that they will do their very, very best. When I'm on stage, as I'm very grateful that many of you have seen me to be, I do my absolute very best to give you all I can in the time that I have so that you can take away something that is implementable and practical. Right here on my book reviews, what I do is that I know many of you don't have time to read an awful lot. So therefore, I try to summarize all of these books so that then you you can take away the key parts or you can decide if this book is for you or if it's not okay i really really do try to do that and and lots lots of us right lots of us do the very best that we can and so he makes this point about you know wanting to go the extra mile and and so on like that and he talks in some ways about how he does but you know what i heard him say something in a podcast uh only about a month ago so i was in between chapters and uh he actually talks about going the first mile first. In other words, if we are going to go the extra mile, are we going the first mile? So his whole point there is that, are we actually meeting expectations first before we go on to exceed them? And it's a very good point. It's a very, very good point. And you know what? A whole industry has exploded out of this. And you know what that industry is called? It's called customer experience. And I was fortunate to uh, interview somebody for the future of retail for Dublin Leo back in January. And I, I asked, I asked her. She's, she's an expert in it. Her name is, is Susanna Houston. And um, I, and I'll tag her actually on this post so you can, you can see her later on. But you know, I, I did ask her. I said, "What is customer experience? Like, what really is it all about?" And she says, "It is simply meeting the expectations of your customer as you set them at every touch point." And you know what? That, that, that is a great point. Is that do we, at every stage of the journey? just meet the expectations and then seek to exceed them. A lot of us try to exceed before we start at all. A lot of us want to be the best. So we're throwing in discounts, for example, before the customer ever wants it. So therefore the customer says, okay, I would like to buy X. And we say, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And I'll give you a good deal in it as well. They never asked for a good deal. They came to you in the first place. Or you, somebody sends in an inquiry and so they have arrived at your door and they have rang the doorbell of your company and maybe we haven't opened the door within the first 30 seconds. In other words, we haven't responded to that email in a sufficient period of time or whatever else it might be. So therefore, are we going the first mile before we go the extra mile? And yes, for sure, there is very little traffic in the extra mile. Yes, I agree with that completely. But you know what? In today's world where our expectations are higher than ever, it is important before we start trying to be out there and, and trying to be the best, like the best at the extra level, is that are we simply meeting expectations in the first place? Because really, actually, I do think that in more and more, I see that that's actually the place. Maybe that's where the hidden extra mile really is. So last night, for example, I was in an Uber. Uh, I was in an Uber to get back to my hotel from, uh, I was at a, a Himalayan Indian dinner, gala dinner, which was amazing. And, uh, and I came back here afterwards, but I have an awful allergic re reaction to mosquito bites. So I walked into CVS and, uh, and somebody there was, you know, I walked in with a particular thing that I take to, it's an antihistamine, it's a homeopathic antihistamine for mosquito bites. And I walked in anyway, and I said, um, do you have this? She said, no. And I said, okay, where could I get it? And she suggested Whole Foods. And I said, okay. And then I said, um, where could I get to a Whole Foods? And she says, I don't know how to give you directions there. 
So I said, okay, thanks. And look, to be fair, it's the woman, right? She answered my query. So off I went anyway, and I got into the Uber and uh, I just got back to the hotel. But as I was going by, then I realized Whole Foods was on the way. And then I said to the Uber driver, I said, um, could, could I pop in here? And then I said, could you let the meter run? Because I don't want you to have to uh, decrease the fare because it was fixed fare. I said, could you let the meter run so that then I can pay for it? And he said, um, I can certainly swing by, but he said, I can't uh, change the meter. And I said, okay. I said, okay. Well, then I said, look, I can tip you extra. So anyway, then in I went and in I went to Whole Foods and I was greeted at the door. Sorry, I wasn't. I walked up to the counter and I took out again what I was looking for. And I said, do you have this? And the guy behind the counter says, um, I don't know, but he says, we could have something over in that aisle over there. Let me call an assistant to help you find it. And I said, oh, that's very nice. So I picked up a radio and he said, hello, or whatever he said. And anyway, by the time I got down to aisle number seven or wherever it was, there was a woman waiting to help me. And I was getting progressively more impressed. And then, uh, so anyway, then we walked over to where the homeopathic remedies are. And then she said, uh, no, we don't have that one, but hold on a second. We have this one instead. And she said, you can, you can take in this dose or this dose. I took the higher one because believe me, I don't want to have to deal with this. And uh, then she says, by the way, if it doesn't work, keep your receipt, bring it back. We will happily refund you for it. So anyway, then I went back outside and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Because I'm in the boot, as you know, I'm in the boot all the time. And sometimes boots, the boot that I'm in for a broken foot doesn't always um, meet surfaces very well. So I fell outside of, of Whole Foods and not badly, but I did anyway. And not bad, as I say, not too bad. So anyway, I was able to pick myself up and get back up. And the Uber driver came straight back over, drove up to where I was gathering myself together. And then, uh, then I sat back in and then he said, is the temperature okay? And there was a bottle of water waiting for me there. And I said, wow, okay. Then he dropped me back to the hotel and I generously left a tip and because uh, he, he deserved it and off I went. But the point was, is that in both cases, they met the expectation first and then they exceeded it. In the case of Whole Foods, I got what I was looking for. Not specifically what I was looking for, but something similar. Um, and then in the case of Uber, I got to my destination in a nice peaceful, you know, safe environment. And then they went the extra mile. And now I'm telling you all about it as well. Now, I mean, Whole Foods and Uber are not requiring me at this very moment to be telling you about their services. I'm sure they don't need uh, any more marketing for them. But the point was, was that I think, yes, we try to go the extra mile, but you know what? Let's just think about first, are we actually going the first mile? Are we going the first mile? And when you think about every interaction, so when they go to your website, can they call you? Is your number clearly there? And yes, this stuff is simple. I know that. And I know you're thinking, Susan, seriously, seriously, is this honestly what you got out of the book? It actually is because you know what? If we don't, it, like think about Apple, right? Apple made a business out of simplicity. Are we overcomplicating things? Are we trying to add on bells and whistles when we simply just need to make a product do just what we say it will do or a service as well? And that's something that I'm, I'm really thinking through at the moment is that I'm trying to look at the touch points of all experiences that you might have with me or with any of the interactions that you might have with my business or, by the way, with any of the clients that we have whereby the interaction ultimately comes to us. Uh, and that's, that's cer certainly something that Brian Buffini has made me think about. The third thing is this, um, and I thought I was good on this, right? I actually did. But you know what? He made me think again. So this is actually challenge number one, which is to upgrade your input, upgrade your input. Now, okay, we've all heard the whole idea, right? If you are surrounding yourself with negative people, well, then you're going to be ostensibly negative yourself and so on like that, right? But he goes further now. He says, okay, what are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you watching? Who are you, who are you reaching out to? Who are you aspiring to be? Who are your role models? That's what he means by your input, right? So, so I thought about this as well, right? Because believe me, I always know that when I read a book, I'm going to be telling you about it. So therefore, I don't just look through my eyes. I look through my eyes and then through your eyes, looking through my eyes, if you know what I mean. So I just think about, well, as you know, one of the values of our company is practice what we preach. So I always think if, if I was to evaluate me from an external perspective, am I doing what I'm espousing that I pick up from these books, right? So that's why it takes me so long to do all of these is that I like it takes me a while to read these. Uh, for, for that reason. So I thought about this, right? Now, since I broke my foot, I spent five months when I couldn't drive um, because I physically couldn't drive. So therefore, I noticed that I wasn't listening to podcasts. And do you know why? It's because I listen to my podcasts in the car. 
So therefore, my daily dose, sorry, my weekly dose of I always listen to the FT Politics podcast. I listen to the Irish Times, Business and Politics podcast, and that's where I get the summary of the week on things like Brexit and various different aspects about the economy from an Irish perspective and a global perspective looking at Ireland and so on, right? Um, so uh, so what I started doing since he reminded me to upgrade my input is that I did a critical review of my podcast and I was thinking, yeah, but they're not broad enough. They're not. They're not broad enough. I'm, I'm looking or listening through a lens of Irish and UK because I'm back driving now again with the last uh, two and a half months. I broke my foot on the 7th of December. So um, so that's that's where I'm at now is that I'm, I'm broadening them. And I started listening to Brian's actually, and uh, and I always come away with one kernel, just one, right? I look for one, and his podcasts are around about 20, 25 minutes. Sometimes they're longer, and sometimes he interviews other people. And sometimes I listen and I get impatient because I've heard what he said already from the book or whatever, um, but I, I, I seek out a kernel, and I always get one. Um, then what I do is that I've also tried actively sought out to find podcasts that I disagree with, right? That I disagree with the title. Something in the title I disagree with. I actively do that so that I know that I'm finding a diverse point of view. So that's what I've done in terms of upgrading my input. And um, also what I've done as well is that I have, uh, the other thing is because I couldn't fly for four months. That's why you haven't seen me do a book review in a long time is because I read when I, when I go away because the natural distractions of home aren't here. So, and of course you can't, um, you can't when the, uh, when a plane is taking off and landing, you have to turn off your laptop. So therefore, I don't turn on laptops anymore on flights. I simply read, right? So that's that's when my reading time is. And um, uh, But that's not good enough, though, is it? It's not good enough. Because if I'm traveling, then I don't read. And then that's not good enough because reading is so important. It is. So uh, so that's one of the things that I'm, I'm certainly going to do. And you, again, hold me accountable to this because I know that in order for one of our newsletters to go out, is that I can't let it go too long before a book review isn't in one. So therefore, you hold me accountable. I believe me, I, I turn to you uh, to hold me accountable to doing a lot of good things in my life that I know should, that should be done. So that's another, uh, that's another point that I've now, since reading, since reading this book, is that I now need to find another slot in my life when it's not just when I am reading, or not just when I'm flying, but when I'm, when I'm reading, I need to read it another time. Uh, and I'm coming around to that. I really am. I haven't pinpointed it yet, but I, I'm coming around to, fi to just finding, finding that time. I, what I will say is, uh, just as regards your input as well, right? Some of your input doesn't ex need to be externally, and that might sound like a complete oxymoron, right? But actually, do you know what sometimes we need to do is to let your thoughts in here form. Now, I've written about this, particularly on Savvy Women Online. And I've written about this in the context that journaling, now he's a big, big, big fan of this. He is a huge fan of, of journaling. But uh, journaling is great if you if you want to do it, if you have the patience to do it, if you like doing it, if it suits you, right? And it's something that I do, not as often as Brian now, but it is something that I do. And the reason that it's a good idea is because I think fast, right? I think faster than I talk, and I talk fast. But my, my hand couldn't keep up. So when you're writing, you actually let your thoughts form. That's what you do. You let your thoughts form. So as a result, when you journal, you, you therefore, you let your thoughts come out. So therefore, when it comes to your input, maybe the input is already in here. It just needs to come out to be processed in again. But I will also tell you something else that I've discovered in the past five days. Last five days have been amazing <laughs> because I've, you know, I've been consistently um, implementing these, these new incremental habits. Um, and that is that I always thought, right, swimming must be the most boring thing possible, right? Because what did you got to do except go up and down and up and down like a goldfish? Like, I mean, great crack. So that that was often what, like, that was, that was the reason I was not a swimmer before. But needs most, right? As I say, I can't do any cardio. I can't, I can't cycle. I can't run. Um, I can walk, but I can't walk like remarkably far or remarkably fast. So I can't do cardio when it comes to any of the above, right? So therefore, I asked my physio, the physio said, the only thing you can do is swim. But you know what I've started doing is that when I go into the pool, because I know I'm not going to be doing anything else, is I give myself something to think about before I get in. And what I did tonight before I went into the pool was I thought about the three key things that I wanted to tell you about in this book review. And they're now all very clear. By the time I came out, I do half an hour in the pool. I do, I'm trying to use that in the present tense. I do half an hour in the pool. Not I am going to do, not I would like to do, I do. So I want to keep it up. 
So in the pool tonight, I thought about, okay, what are the three key things that I wanted to tell you? And, uh, and you know, my three key things are about his consistency, was about um, going the first mile, not just as well as the extra mile. And then thirdly was about upgrading your input. And every night that I have been in the pool for the last four nights before, well, I took one night off, as I say, I took one night off last night, and the last three before that. When I come out of the pool, I write down my ideas. And I've started implementing them as well, and they've actually started to yield results too. Um, small ones, but all the same. But that's what I've started doing, is that I've actually started taking the input out of my head, because that has been put in there by other things that I don't really, subconsciously, that I don't really know about. And I'm using swimming or the thinking time that I have in the pool to let it come out. So that's how I've been upgrading my input is, okay, number one, broadening it to make sure that I'm finding enough diverse range of views. Um, and making sure that if, you know, something happens like I break my foot and I'm not in the car or I don't fly, that that doesn't stop. Um, uh, secondly, is that I have also then made sure that when I've been thinking about um, upgrading my input is that I'm actively making sure that the habits are in place, that, that, that it's on autopilot. And then the third thing is that I'm making, with my swimming, I'm now giving myself a task to think about. Uh, and I have, and so I don't just jump into the pool and not think, unless I need it, because sometimes you might just need to de-stress, but that hasn't happened yet. So therefore, that is how I have been upgrading my input. So therefore, they are the three key things. Highly recommend it. I do highly recommend it. Um, I always, you know, mention that in, the, in my book reviews, who I would suggest to not read this book, right? And it's hard to say, actually, because I think it's a very good book for for everyone but you know what i've said this about other books as well like i kind of hear particularly no fears no excuses uh when i reviewed that a couple of weeks ago was that's a bit ago now is if you don't want your life to improve if you just want to whinge about how bad it is brian buffini is not the guy to go to he, he's really really not the other thing that i will say is i and i haven't done this before is that i will mention that this book is a really good combination with deep work by cal newport and i mentioned i book, i reviewed that book months ago now but uh, Cal Newport's book about deep work is about how to go really deep and to do something that's really, you know, how to make things really, really matter. And um, that is that book is brilliant. And I have implemented that. And the things that I told you that that time in that book review has led to great, great, great help. Uh, Brian Buffini's book is more how to do small incremental things that make a difference. So they're almost like a T, right? So Brian Buffini is how to do things broadly, that incremental things that will have an impact impact. A Cal Newport's book is how to do things deeply that will have a really big impact as well and put the two together like I'm doing. And uh, and I think, well, they're working out for me so far. So here, live from Charlottesville, Virginia. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in tonight. I know that uh, at home in Ireland, it's late at the moment. I see that some of you have joined me from there. So thank you very much. And I also see that uh, some of Ireland's family in San Diego, California, or well, not quite San Diego, but in California, who I met up with when you're there. Hello to you, Anna. Great, great to see you and great to see that, that you've joined in. And Brian Buffini, uh, if you're watching, thanks so much indeed for, uh, for giving me uh, this book. I really do hope that you continue to make the difference that you do. You've got, I know, 20,000 clients and that you've helped uh, 3 million people uh, right around the world. And I know that you often hold true to your Irish roots. And uh, on behalf of the nation, uh, thanks so much for doing that. You're doing an amazing job. Best wishes to you, Beverly, and your six children. And a final thank you to Brendan Sweeney, who introduced me to you. So to each and every one of you, thank you and goodbye.